Our first speaker will be Professor Khalid Forani, who teaches anthropology at Tel Aviv University. He is the author of Silencing the Sea, Secular Rhythms in Palestinian Poetry, Stanford University Press 212, 2012, and also Redeeming Anthropology, a Theological Critique of a Modern Science, Oxford University Press 2019. He is also the author of a fascinating, very provocative little, an intelligent little piece, uh, Buber and My Grandmother, which, which appeared in, it, it has a funny title, but it's an extremely serious little, uh, little article, <laughs> Buber and My Grandmother, which appeared in Tikkun magazine in uh, 2021, and which was originally a presentation at a conference in honor of Paul Mendes Flores biography of uh, Martin Buber. Uh, Khaled, please. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Great. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, thank you, organizers. Better? OK. This is better for all of you now? OK. Thank you, organizers, each and everyone for inviting, and audience for presence. Uh, I want to start by uh, saying something that uh, could sound crazy about my argument. I'm going to argue one thing, but at the same time argue against it. Uh, it may sound crazy, but I hope this is just one way uh, to get to a puzzle I'd like to share with you. Uh, and that's what I hope to do uh, by the end of the talk, that you, you'll be able to see the puzzle I'm, I'm trying to describe, trying to articulate. Uh, and it comes to understanding Buber's relationship with Islam. So I'm sorry to disappoint you. The title has changed uh, from um, Buber and Recovering a Life in Palestine to Buber uh, Meeting and Non-Meeting Islam. And one reason for this change is really an inspiration from a student of mine in a seminar I'm teaching and which uh, Paul, uh, Tamar, and I so kindly visited and, and graced us with your visit, in which this uh, student uh, strikingly shared something she's experiencing in reading Buber. And she said, I feel when he talks about Judaism, or Hasidim especially, he talks about Islam, when he talks about religion. And I had the same feeling. Um, so my talk is inspired by that uh, exchange with the student. Um, and perhaps it's an apt, uh, place that I begin explaining my title, meeting, Buber's meeting a non-meeting Islam. Uh, invoking meeting and not seeing, I take a cue directly uh, from Buber himself. Buber once wrote that all life is meeting, Paul tells us. Alles wirkliche Leben ist Begegnung. Here I wish to merely begin the ways in which Buber, in his pursuit of dialogue, both met but largely did not meet Islam. Before I begin, I should address a rather basic question. Why should it matter? Why should Buber's relation to Islam matter in the first place? Perhaps an obvious, but not very profound answer is that such an exploration contributes to, contributes to a critical appraisal of this promoter of dialogue. It assesses the degree to which Buber took his own medicine, as it were. In the case of meeting, uh, begeg begegnering Islam, right here in Jerusalem, where it is reasonable to expect that he also heard the Adhan, the call for daily prayers. But a less obvious and perhaps more compelling answer is that this relation uh, between Islam and Buber may point to something beyond it. Beyond Buber's project of articulating the grammar of ideological subject, communal vitality, and a world not beholden to the conceits and to the ruins of Europe's Enlightenment triumphal reason. So I'll reserve my attempt to articulate what this case is, or the problematic arising from this relation between Buber and Islam, to the conclusion. For now, let me delve in to uh, the ways in which Buber both meets and fails to meet Islam. After reviewing many of Buber's writing, I feel it's safe to propose that Buber had a complex, uneasy, and conflictual relation with his particular other, that is Islam, which is not to be conflated, of course, with Muslims. But then you would ask, of course, why shouldn't he? He had a conflicted relation with Judaism, right? In Buber's writing, one can note at once 
recognition and misrecognition of Islam. More precisely, I find Buber vindicating many truths of Islam while erasing Islam from his writing, that is, from the site of his, he would say, meeting. In some sense, as I said, this duality, if that's the right word for it, shouldn't surprise us. It would be useful to recall the ways in which Buber had troubled relation, as I said, with his own Jewish faith, to sound Protestant about it, making him a kind of Epicurean Jew, or what he would say, an obstinate Jew. He actually called himself that. Yet this critical traditionalist overlooking of Islam, even while fully living in its midst, or probably he would say next door, like a neighbor, should perhaps not surprise us for another reason. This troubled relationship shouldn't trouble us, shouldn't surprise us, sorry, for another reason. It's not as obvious. It's actually too removed from my own ken. And therefore, I find myself unable to adequately address it, but strikes me as perhaps worthy of another exploration. I'm referring to the possible impact of Buber's closeness to the author of the Stern der Illusung, State of Redemption, and namely, as you can expect, Franz Rosenzweig. In Rosenzweig's expressions of invidious disregard of Islam. Hard as this man tried to overcome Hegel's method, as Jean Kahn reminds us, Rosenzweig remained ensnared and caged by speculative and resentful views of religions he did not prefer. So end up learning about his relation to Islam than about Islam itself. But before I digress, let me stress, I'm not concerned with the causes of Buber's conflicted or discrepant relation with Islam. Rather, I'm particularly concerned with how he conducts this relation. In one ways, he does what I call locutionary, uh, uh, erasure of Islam, but at the same time, perlocutionary vindication of Islam. By locution, I mean the use of his words, and perlocutionary, I mean the impact of his words. When you read him, like my student said, I feel he's describing Islam. So let me start with the locutionary. By that, I mean locutionary. Um, Erasure Islam. There are two ways he conducts that erasure. First, in his work comparing religion, Buber generally omits Islam when he provides examples to support his claims. He refers to religions and uh, religious traditions much far, far afield, including many times when Islam could have readily provided the same or even more poignant example. I'd like to review four instances by way of illustration, and I hope I can make it in time. The first example is Buber writing on Sufis. Very interesting. Uh, probably the most prominent and direct expatiating on things Islamic. He notes Muslim mystics, yet without naming them as such. Rather, and quite strikingly, only with the arisats of Sufi, applied only to one among them in his book, Ecstatic Confession. This covering, pun intended, of Islam joins, of course, an entrenched discursive practice in the West, which simply, uh, uh, simply put, inhibits or dilutes a vision of Islam as the uh, condition of possibility for Sufism. In keeping with this veritable procedure, Buber incorrectly, even misleadingly, titles a section, India, uh, in which he places four well-known mystics of Islam who hail from uh, what today we call Turkey, Iran, uh, Iraq. Uh, uh, people, I'm talking about people like Rumi and Attar and Al-Hallaj and, and Al-Bistami, as their names could tell, they're from those ancient lands. Um, and in a subsequent section titled The Sufis and Their Followers, he seems to arbitrarily place a single additional mystic of Islam, Rabi al adawiyah who comes from Basra. Islam is not allowed in this book into the table of contents alongside nearly every other world religion, civilization, and tradition. As a result, in Buber's typology, Muslims alone have no mysticism to their name, but Jews, Greeks, Christians, and Chinese all do. In the second example, Buber's exemplification as a mode of locutionary erasure occurs in the, in the very way Buber conceives of religion in the, contrast with, in the contrast with philosophy. In the Eclipse of God, for example, he identifies a common perception whereby the investigation of essences is allocated to philosophy and the investigation of salvation is allocated to religion. And he states, I'm quoting, the principal tendency of religion is rather to show the essential unity of the two the unity of investigating essences and salvation at once. His illustrations here come as they typically do from the Torah, the New Testament, but also from Taoism, and not, and not from, shall I say, next door, Islam, 
which could have most readily served his point with Islam's understanding of the unity and the oneness of God. As for the so many ways to show that, but think of the phrase in Arabic, Rabbul Alameen, the, the, the sustainer of the universes. Let me go to a third example where this locutionary erase, uh, erasure happens, um, where he locks Islam out from his statements. Think about it, his uh, publication, Knowledge and Deed. Uh, am I going too fast? It's okay? Okay, thank you for telling me. I felt that. So let me drink, calm down, and be able to contact. Uh, Buber quotes only Hasidism and ancient fathers who saw, according to him, the simple man, I'm quoting, the simple man who acts is given a preference over the scholar whose knowledge is not expressed in deeds. On the relation between knowing and doing, he adds, I'm quoting, what counts is to know what one knows and to believe what one believes so directly that it can be translated into the life one lives, end of quote. If Buber had allowed himself a view of Islam, I wonder to what extent he would have met the Hasids and the ancient fathers and found them alive and kicking and breathing in the Muslim lives around him. <coughs> Recall that Buber acknowledged that making, his words, making the other present occurs when the other becomes itself for me. Perhaps, perhaps this is an apt place uh, to posit a particularly related question, maybe pushing the envelope a bit. In what ways Buber's defense of Hasidism, as he understood it, sort of as post-hieratic or priestless and lived relation to God, arguably constitutes a defense of Islam or what Islam stands for? The fourth and final example uh, of this erasure, recall that when Buber imagined this land as justly shared one day, he pinned down a great part of his hopes on both Arab and Jewish intellectuals. Crucially, he expressed spiritual representatives of Arabs, but not Muslims, nor Muslims and Christians, but Arabs as such, to bring dialogue based on mutual sincerity and recognition. It's crucial to take note of the importance of this class of spiritual representatives. What did he mean by that? Um, it's invoked by him because for Buber, they stand for intellectuals, and intellectuals stand for the custodians of culture and spirit, his words. Yet if the intellectual class, I wonder, is entrusted with the spirit, it remains doubtful that members of such a class can heed his call without any reliance on or reconciliation with forces in their society that are manifestly concerned with the spirit, namely those of religion. So much I've said for the first mode of locutionary erasure of Islam. For his second mode of erasing Islam, let's consider Bubul's call for a pan-national state. It entails the discursive role allotted to the Arab in contrast with the Muslim as I just mentioned in the binational state proposition. The very call uh, to such a state entails a dismissal of the ummatic from the word ummah in Arabic, or the communal, the Muslim communal aspiration. It called for one people to come together, in this case, the Jews emerging as a revitalized community in Palestine, but in advocating a state, it would have served to cut off local Arabs and Muslims from their wider communities of the Arab and Muslim world. One would have expected from this anarchic Jew to love his neighbor as he would have loved himself. And theoretically, at least, allow in his thinking, just in his thinking, the Muslim what he allows the Jew. To the extent that the state remained, and it didn't always remain, we've learned that, that much, to the extent that the state has remained his, uh, his horizon for political imagination, and if one is to think along with the logic of a state sharing between two communities, a more dialogical and therefore more consistent uh, a, a imagination uh, more consistent with his, his vision uh, than a binational state would have been a bi-traditional or bi-communal or intercommunal or still better, no state for all communities. Indeed, if communal vitality is the equal right for all. But I truly wonder if this land was to host in Buber's eyes the collective spiritual renewal of only one community, the Jewish people. However, this erasure let me note, this erasure is not, crucially, where the story of Buber and Islam can or should end. I want, in the remainder of this exploration, I want to focus on the ways in which, while Buber conducts 
a locutionary razor also conducts a perlocutionary vindication of it. And forgive me, sir, if I digress, um, not digress, excuse me, extend. I, uh, will you, uh, thank you. Do I have your permission? Okay. Uh, Buber's inability to meet Islam does not negate the fact that he also vindicated, perhaps unwittingly, something about Islam. He vindicated the truths of Islam as a form of life striving for excellence. Here I detect what I call a musical affinity between Buber and Islam. Um, and um, a testimony for that, it comes from his friend, the Muslim Qadi, Farid Wajdi Tabari, who wrote to him, and I'm quoting his Qadi friend, his judge friend, I felt, I even felt that you, Buber, are close to my soul. And I now wish to identify seven truths or truthful features of Islam as vindicated by Buber, uh, who seems to me, hints to me that maybe he too was close to Islam's soul or seal it. Revelation, first example. Buber offers this vindication of the lasting epistemic, uh, uh, lasting epistemic and emancipatory space that Islam is, or any other tradition for that matter that admits revelation. And he says the following. Dogma, even when its claim of origin remains uncontested, has become the most exalted form of invulnerability against revelation. Revelation will tolerate no perfect tense, but man, with the, with the arts of his craze for security, props it up to perfectedness. He adds in the social dimension of man that super-rational truth does not disown reason, but holds it up in her lap. The Quran continually reminds humans how revelation hosts reason, as in the verse, quoting in English first and then in Arabic, he has made, he refers to God, uh, made subject to you the night and the day, the sun and the moon and the stars in the subjection by his command. Verily, in, these, in, this, in this are signs for those who reason. وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمِ اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَارِ وَالشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرِ وَالنُّجُومَ مُسَّخَّرَاتٍ بِأَمْرِهِ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لِآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَعْقِلُونَ يَعْقِلُ is the word reason in Arabic. The conditions of Muhammad's prophetic mission and Islam's founding. In searching for his community's renewal by visiting the foundational moments of a people's arrival and ascent in the historical scene, Buber's statements about the Israelites feel resonant, feels resonant with the founding of the early Muslim communities in Mecca and Medina. The Prophet Muhammad began by exhorting the Arabs, be they pagan, pagans, Jews, or Christians of Arabia, to unite in rekindling their worship of one and common God. This prophetic beckoning follow, followed degrading tribal wars uh, among the tribes of Arabia and a degraded Kaaba which the Prophet Muhammad strove to revive, the Quran tells us, according to the plans of original builders, Ibrahim and his son, Ismail, Abraham and Ishmael. It was to be a site of worshiping God alone and not idols. We hear this history musically in Buber's words about the Jewish people. He says, the people falls away, and Israel, from a historical point of view, fallen apart and disunited, does not stand firm. But in its conquered state, it again makes itself subject to the will of God, resolves and you to accept God's dominion, and again, a divine mission occurs." End of quote. Consider also how Buber sets a relation and even affinity between the prophetic act and, attempts at establishing, and the attempt at establishing justice on earth, all but naming uh, Muhammad in his mission. I'm quoting him. The prophets are calling a community to establish its task, the task of justice in the community and beyond. He seems to paraphrase a, a, a verse from the Quran in when it says, I'm quoting from the Quran, indeed we sent our messengers, in the plural, indeed we sent our messengers with clear signs and sent down with them the book and the balance that people may uphold justice. End of this, the, the verse. Religion and life, that's another way of uh, feeling his vindication. In describing Islam without naming it, Buber describes what has been so challenging for a liberal a secular reason to understand about Islam's insistence on wholeness, a wholeness he would have loved to witness in modern Jewish life, I believe. This difficulty, to be sure, does not face liberal reason, reason only in regard to Islam, but in relation to any religious formation that refuses to be caged in the Protestant grammar of the modern concept of religion. Buber clearly 
has that plurality of religious formation in mind as they variously arrange their relation to life, including the life of the Polirico. Buber captures such traditions for whom living and living religiously is one and the same, and the same in saying, the realer the religion is, so much the more it means it's overcoming. It will cease to be the spiritual domain of religion and wills to become life itself. It strives towards the pure every day. And I would have add, in the case of Islam, and especially Islam in Palestine, close to where Buber lived and still closer to where he taught, this every day has children playing football or playing hide and seek on the esplanade of Al-Haram al-Sharif, the noble sanctuary of Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. Let me uh, go to only two more examples of her perlocutionary uh, uh, vindication of Islam, and then I'll conclude. Thank you. A particularly um, powerful place in which Buber vindicates the truth of Islam without meeting Islam is evident in his contrasting the Greek concept of Sophia with the Hebrew chokhmah, which is stunningly, stunningly really uh, close phonetically, se uh, semantically, and conceptually to the uh, Muslim locution in the Arabic word uh, hikmah, hikmah and chokhmah. In this great act of not identifying the neighbor or the kin, linguistically at least, Buber brashly claims, I'm quoting him, among all the peoples in the world, Israel is probably the only one in which wisdom that does not lead directly to unity of knowledge and deed is meaningless. Sorry. Buber also adds that uh, supremely unifies, the, Buber also adds that Chokhmah supremely unifies teaching and life. For only through such unity can we recognize and avow all embracing unity of God. In response to Buber's claim, we could perhaps invoke the centrality of Hikmah in the Quran, uh, mentioned 20 so uh, times, 20 or so times. And uh, specifically, uh, the connection in the Quran between uh, Iman, faith, and Amal, labor or work. Um, Listen to this verse, for example. Whoever works righteousness, whether male or female, while he or she is a true believer, verily to him we will give a good life, and we shall pay them certainly a reward in proportion to the best of what they used to do. Let's go to the final thing, which is God here, as an example of his vindication of Islam. In not wanting to allow the Muslims to partake in the ultimate truth that Christians, and especially Jews, according to Buber, have, the truth of God or God that God uh, as the truth itself, Buber's ap Buber appears to refuse to widen the circle of belonging to God. As when he says, our God, he implies the God of Judaism, is not the God of Christianity. Although what he says about the former very much applies to Allah, as we some call God in Arabic, the God of all peoples and universes in the plural, as again the phrase, Rabbil Alameen. Because he says, for our God, I'm quoting Buber, makes only one demand upon us. He does not expect a, human, a humanly unattainable completeness and perfection, but only the willingness to do, to do as much as we possibly can at every single instant. Islam similarly comprehends God through mercy more frequently than through love, as evident in the Quran stating, and I'm yeah, quoting from the Quran, God does not burden any human self with more than it is well able to bear. In its favor shall be whatever good it does, and against it, whatever evil it does. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها لها ما كسبت وعليها ما اكتسبت. Continuing with the theme of refraining from burdening you, it is time I concluded. I started by stating the primary concern of this talk, to describe the modes, not the motives, by which Buber both erases Islam in his writing and yet vindicates it. I am ultimately concerned with understanding the case for which this duality of erasure and vindicate stands. This is part of the puzzle with which, I'm not, with which I want to conclude. To say it more specifically, the puzzle is about the teachability of Buber's case. What do we learn from this relationship with Islam in Buber's writing? <clears throat> what do we stand to learn from a Jew who, while erasing Islam from his writing, ends up affirming it in his overall project to exit the ensnaring and monological Cartesian subject? For despite his apparent myopia in regard to Islam, could Buber's insights offer ways to cease to see Islam merely as religion, but rather outside or without religion, 
as he would have liked. He pushes us to, to see it, as he does for religions in general, as a paradigm for thinking and living at once, for asking and for searching, for filling and overcoming, for striving for excellence or wholeness while living our finite and fixable lives on this earth. I hope it has been clear to you that my point is not at all to indict Buber. I appreciate him enough to not take that path, but to push the conversation further. For as Paul reminded us yesterday, Buber was not for foreclosure, but understood himself to be conducting a conversation. So the puzzle remains. Could the type of conversation about emancipa emancipating how we all may prophetically live in Palestine, how we prophetically think about what religion can and should stand for the world over, and finally about the world itself, may prophetically rebound and flourish out of the ruins of deceived and deceiving reason that we inherited from Europe's enlightenment with Islam's participation and not, not its exclusion could all this be part of Buber's legacy today? Thank you, and I apologize for the delay. Thank you.